Dios los bendiga. May God bless you. How beautiful to be in your homes once again, in your homes, in your cell phones, by any media that you are using to be connected to the study of this day. Today we are going to continue in the second book of Samuel, chapter 15. And last week, I did a very brief overview uh, on verse 12, so that today we can dig deep into who Ahitophel was and what uh, role did he play in this story and where does this bitterness proceed, this bitterness that came out of his heart and how he united with Absalom. So 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 12 and the scripture says, Then Absalom sent for Ahitophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, from his city, from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy grew strong. For the people with Absalom continually increased in number. And this is uh, what we're going to name the theme of this study, which is going to be the union of Ahitophel with Absalom. And we are going to ask ourselves this question. What is it that united these two men? And the answer is resentment, bitterness, and their hunger for vengeance. I looked in the dictionary. What is resentment? What is resentment? We have been speaking for several weeks about resentment and the definition of resentment is a persistent feeling of disgust or displacement with someone. It is the pain for an offense that was received. Resentment reflects in several emotions and hostile attitudes. They are people who are incapable to forgive. People who are incapable of forgiving. We ought to be very careful to protect our heart, guard our heart from this terrible emotion because this emotion corrupts all things. Some are a reflection of what they are dragging along from the past. And many times we act based on what we are dragging from that past and for not letting it go. Listen to this, for not letting it go. The past is a past. When we come to Christ, we have the capacity through our will and through God's forgiveness of releasing that past, of releasing those offenses. But there are some who don't want to release it. Our emotions are going to react according to what is in our hearts. Let's look. We're going to begin once again with 2 Samuel chapter 15. And we're going to look very closely at Ahitophel, as we told, as I told you in the beginning. The bitter ones always wait for the right opportunity. Ahitophel was a bitter one. So the bitter ones are always going to wait for the opportunity to take vengeance. Here, all it took was one call. Everything in Ahitophel's heart began to come out. We saw that Absalom waited for four years after he was in Jerusalem to promote himself, to make his campaign in favor of himself, to divide the kingdom. And for years he was next to his father, making this campaign for himself. Ahitophel was waiting for 11 years. 11 years waiting for the opportunity to take vengeance. And we're going to see a little bit further more what the offense was. We're going to see what it is that didn't allow him to forgive David, though he was with David for 11 years. And so the conspiracy develops here uh, from Absalom and Ahitophel. 
and it was one phone call. That's all it took. Just one phone call was sufficient to for them to unite. And so we're going to figure, we're going to figure that conversation. It doesn't tell us what they talked about, but it does tell us the result of that conversation. And so we're going to figure it. They possibly began with a greeting as usual. Ahitofel, how is it going? This is Absalom. How are you doing? I want to tell you that I already left the church of my father, David, and I'm here in Hebron, and I've raised up my own church, and I'm looking for people that are brilliant, people like you, and there where you are, you're not being recognized, and I know that you're very brilliant. You were my father's counselor, the intimate of my father, and I'll recognize you at the church, my church. And so what was the result that Ahitophel went to the army of Absalom? And so notice how this conspiracy developed. And it says, And the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. Off of just one phone call, we're going to see how Ahitophel adds himself to the rebellion of Absalom. And that phone call alone is what lit up the fire to grow the conspiracy against the kingdom of David. Who was Ahitophel? Let's look at it in detail. If you have the opportunity for you to take a notebook or a piece of paper and write down these scriptures, because we're going to pay real close attention to Ahitophel and we're going to see how this hatred began this resentment to this bitterness, these desires of vengeance against David. And we're going to begin to see, beloved in Christ, in Psalm 55. And from there, we're going to realize in Psalm 55, who was Ahitophel. And David does not mention him by name, but we can realize that he's speaking about him because of the position he has in verse 12. And David says, when he's broken already, and this is in the time of the conspiracy, it is the time where he has to flee running. There is a menace of death for him and his followers. And the beautiful thing is that there's always going to be loyal people, just like there are those who betray, just like there are those who are unloyal and who are bitter. There is always going to be faithful, loyal people in the Lord's church. So we're going to see the end of the unloyal. And we're also going to see the reward of those who continue in the work of the Lord. And so I gave you this pause so that you could find that paper and a pen. And let's see what Psalm 55 verse 12 says. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor it is one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal. Ahitophel was an intimate friend of David. And now he was also his counselor. It says, my companion and my acquaintance who took sweet counsel together and walk to the house of God in the throng. Now, see for yourself who Ahitophel was. David considered him his intimate one. And the intimate ones are trusted with secrets. They are trusted even family matters. That is why it is very terrible and God does not stop or hold back the judgment against the unloyal because of the honorable position with which they are trusted. So, beloved in Christ, let's go to Psalm 41. There, where we are in the book of Psalms, and we're going to continue to see who Ahitophel was for David. In verse 9, of Psalm 41, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. 
a backstabbing wound, a wound of treason of the highest level. And Ahitophel is a type of a Judas. Here we see the picture of a Judas. And to eat together, because David mentioned it in the Psalms, it says, who ate my bread, in whom I trusted. And I'm going to stop right here, beloved. And I want you to have this very, very uh, conscious in your mind, what it means to eat together. It is a covenant of loyalty. And you might say, well, that's why I don't invite anybody to eat at my table at my house. But let me tell you that when we come together to church, we come together and have the Lord's Supper together. It is a symbol of communion, of faithfulness. In the East, it is a symbol of a covenant that cannot be broken. And for that reason, listen, beloved in Christ, you who are people of God, you who sit at the table of the Lord at least uh, once a month to celebrate the, Lo the Lord Jesus Christ's supper by eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. This is the reason uh, why the Lord's Supper is so um, meaningful. Not only because it represents Christ's broken body through the bread, but the blood that he shed through the juice of the vine. In addition to that, what it means to come together, what does it represent? To sit together and eat of the bread and drink of the Lord's cup as a church, as members of the church, as members of the body of Christ, who is the church, it is a symbol of loyalty to your brothers and sisters and a sign of loyalty to the church. That is why, that is why the treason of Judas was so big that it costed him his life. Where was Judas on the last night before the Lord was given up he was sitting at the table with him when judas gave the kiss to jesus to give him up the lord didn't break the covenant he said friend with a kiss you turn me in and that was his answer to this treasonous action of judas do you realize the root of bitterness and unloyalty that was found in Ahitophel was to forget that covenant. And how many times have we not violated the covenant of God with hatred and resentments in our hearts, sitting down, lifting our hands and saying, oh, brother, sister, God bless you. But like Ahitophel with David, he smiled. He smiled at him for 11 years. For 11 years, he sat at the table with him. For 11 years, they worshiped together in the temple. 11 years, he heard and he saw the weaknesses of David. And he made a real good archive to later go against him. But there is a root, and we are going to see it. And we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. What is this terrible root that he never got out of his heart and did not have a good ending? In chapter 23, in verse 34, and we're going to situate ourselves there. And so here is the list of the valiant men of David. He had 600 valiant men, but out of those 600 valiant men, there was a small group who stood out. And we're going to see here the names. In verse 34, it says, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 34. It says, Eliphalet, the son of Ahasabi, the son of the Machathite. And then it says, Eliam, the son of Ahitophel, the Gilanite. So now, we see that Eliam, write that down or highlight it or write that name down, Eliam. Eliam was the son of Ahitophel. And so Eliam was one of the mighty men or the valiant men of David. And Ahitophel, who was the father of Eliam, was constituted by David, his counselor, possibly an older man, 
a man of experience, and named him his counselor. And we are situating Ahitophel there. And so we're going to see Second Samuel, and we're going to go back to chapter 11 to have a clearer vision of the resentment that Ahitophel had. And let's go to chapter 11, verse 3. And the scripture says, So David sent and inquired about the woman, and the woman who he is referring to, we dealt with this in chapter 11 when we spoke about David's sin, and his sin was adultery. He took a, a woman who he saw, she was taking a bath uh, by the palace, and he asked who this woman was, and they answer her. And someone said, it is, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? And we see that Eliam is the son of Ahitophel. And so therefore, Ahitophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And so it's more clear for us by reading this, we have situated Ahitophel, the advisor of David, his son Eliam, Eliam is the son of Ahitophel, and he is the father of Bathsheba. And I think with this, we're going to have a, a more deep uh, gaze into where does Ahitophel come from and where does his resentment uh, is born. And so the woman that David took was the wife of Uriah the Hittite and in chapter 11, we saw everything that happened, the whole story, how it unfolded, and how David tried to hide his sin. And he tried to hide the sin of adultery, and he sent for Uriah the Hittite to be killed. Um, and he was an innocent man, and he was a very loyal man. And this, without a doubt, brought in Ahitophel a seed of bitterness, of hatred of resentment, of unforgiveness. God forgave David. And yes, David repented. He recognized that he had sinned. And God forgave him. But Ahitophel did not forgive. And Eliam, being the father, did forgive. Being the father of Bathsheba, we find him amongst the list of the mighty men of David. And so these were mighty men who did amazing feats and victories. And so this small group that we see in verse 34, we read about where we found um, the mighty men of David. There are some mighty men who stood out and look at how beautiful it is to learn to forgive to stand out amongst, amongst the mighty men, that is where Eliam stood out. Yes, they violated his daughter. Certainly David did wrong. He betrayed the loyalty of Eliam. But Eliam forgave. On the other hand, Ahitophel did not forgive and his heart got filled with bitterness and he waited for the precise moment to take vengeance on David. because of the violation that his granddaughter received. And so let's look at this part very closely. Two resentful men. Absalom was resentful because they violated his sister Tamar. Now Ahitophel, which is another resentful one, he's resentful because his granddaughter Bathsheba was taken by David and he was not able to forgive. And so here two resentful ones unite, strengthening strengthening each other to harm David's kingdom. And that kingdom of David's was the kingdom of God. God was establishing his kingdom so that from the descendancy of David, one would rise, one who would be the savior of the world. The plan of God was salvation. And how many resentful ones are opposing the plan of God for the salvation of many souls. And it says here that the conspiracy grew strong and the number of people who followed Absalom increased. 
How terrible, brothers and sisters. Eleven years. Ahitophel, next to David, faking to be a friend, smiling at him, sitting with him at his table, but with a heart filled with bitterness, with resentment, waiting for the precise moment to pour out his bitterness and act in vengeance. That moment arrived. He found another resentful one. He found an Absalom. And now he calls him so that he would will unite in the rebellion against his father, the king. And we see here a law, which is the law of attraction. It's like a magnet. And so the same is always going to look for the same. A resentful one is always going to look for another resentful one to strengthen themselves in their wickedness and to try to quench their insatiable desires of vengeance. And beloved in Christ, they are terrible and in potential and harm against the church. And not just the church, not just in the spiritual life, but they also end up destroying themselves and their families. Ahitophel is the Judas of the Old Testament. God will never support or back up the rebellious one. And it seems that they strengthen each other. They grew stronger. It seemed that their new church was having success and there was people in Hebron and there are people who are deceived and follow them and there are resentful people. There's lots of resentful people. We live in a world that is resentful. We all have gone through this. The fall hurt us so bad. There's always going to be someone who's going to let us down. There's always going to be someone who's going to let us down. We saw Mephibosheth. It was his caregiver who dropped him, trying to take care of him. She dropped him. So there's always going to be someone who's going to drop us. That's always going to be happen. And there's always going to be someone who is going to try to, to harm us purposely. That is how this world is. But we are not of this world because Christ has saved us through salvation from this world. But beloved, there are always going to be resentful, bitter people, but it doesn't have to be you. And I don't have to be part of that group who goes after the deceit, that goes after the Ahitophels and the Absalons. No, beloved, the end of Ahitophel was not good. Let's go to Second Samuel and let's go uh, chapter 17. Go just a little bit forward to Second Samuel 17. And I'm going to go forward a little bit, and then we're going to take it back and go step by step into what was the advice or counsel of Ahitophel uh, to end with his father's kingdom, which they were very brilliant, by the way. Um, Ahitophel learned from David uh, all of the strategies of war, and he learned a lot. And so when the resentful one leaves, they, they go, and they're brilliant, and they shine everywhere they go, but not for long. So 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. And it says, Now when Ahitophel saw that his advice was not followed, because, beloved in Christ, we go to a new place and we come huh, with a lot of good advice that we bring from where we used to be. But the pastor has discernment. Uh, he might be able to be deceived for a while, maybe not deceived, maybe just outshined, you know, with, with all of the good projects and with all of the good activities. But there, uh, and, and, but it, this happens quickly uh, that the Lord gives each king, each pastor, each angel of the church, gives them their own vision. And they already have their own vision. And there's a moment that the pastor will say, Oh, this is a good advice, but there is a moment where God will say, No. And so Ahitophel sees that his advice was not followed. He saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. So we see that the Judases are always are going to end with a rope that they themselves prepare and hang themselves. That is how the Judas of the Old Testament ended.
the intimate friend of David, his advisor, his counselor, the one who ate from his table, the one who heard David's secrets. That is how he ended, hanged on the same rope that he prepared. Treason is the beginning of the preparation of that rope. Let's go once again. Let's continue in verse 14 of 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14. And it says, So David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, We are your servants, ready to do whatever my lord the king commands. Then the king went out with all his household after him. But the king left ten women, concubines, to keep the house. And the king went out with all the people after him and stopped at the outskirts. In the middle of the backstabbing, of the treason, of the darkness, of the pain, in the middle of the divisions caused by the enemy, because God does not divide. I see in the scripture that the Lord Jesus multiplies. But in the middle of all of that darkness, of all of that pain that David is suffering, he leaves Jerusalem with loyal people. The loyal, the faithful will always shine in the midst of the darkness. And that is beautiful that God will always have at hand people who love him, people who are willing to continue in the good times and in the bad times. David is not going to fight against his own son. He's not going to fight against the ones who have continued in deceit being deceived or the ones who are deceived by their own resentments like Absalom and Ahitophel. And here, beloved, we begin to see the picture of Christ on his, on his journey to Calvary. The son of David, Jesus Christ, left Jerusalem. First and foremost, he left the new Jerusalem. He left the heavenly Jerusalem and he left his throne. And when he came here, he was rejected. Israel rejected him. The same thing that is happening with David. Israel rejected him. It says that it says that the people that followed Absalom increased. And they stayed there waiting for Absalom to be proclaimed king. Beloved in Christ. But in that journey that the Lord Jesus made coming out of Jerusalem, going outside of Jerusalem to where he was crucified, he did it voluntarily so that nobody would die. He did not want Israel to be destroyed. And someone said of the same priests, it's better that one man dies and not the whole nation. The Lord Jesus fulfilled that word He preferred to leave and not, and not for Israel to die, the whole nation. David did the same thing. He left his throne. He left Jerusalem. He left alone. He left not alone, but with loyal people, faithful people that were with him at all times. Because in the midst of the treason of unloyalty, the faithful will always stand out. The one who is faithful is faithful at all times, no matter what happens. The people who have that spirit of faithfulness, because that comes as a gift of the Spirit. That comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Those faithful people left with David to an uncertain place without knowing whether they were going to go back with life. They didn't go alone. They went with all their families. And here the question comes, why is it that there are unfaithful people? And why is it that there are faithful people? And in this time of pandemic, we have heard 
brothers and sisters of ministries that have had to pause. Even some have had to close their churches down. And, and I'm, I'm not saying a temporary closure. I'm saying permanent closure. Why? Because in the time of the celebration, the church was filled. There was people who said, Pastor, we are with you. There were people who said, your plans are good, Pastor. Here is my support. You're going to buy this land to build. I'm going to support you on a monthly basis. Why was their response? Because there was no problems. Everybody is faithful when everything is going good. But the one who is truly faithful is tested in the good times and the bad times. Brother, sister, your pastor has believed in your word. You did. You planned projects together before the pandemic. We made a commitment to support those projects and everybody accepted. Everybody accepted. Of course, there was no pandemic. Everything was going well. Everything was a celebration. This came without a notice. And that is how the treason came to David without a notice. All of a sudden, he gets the news. The one who said he was going to go worship, he faked that he was a worshiper, he was with you. Now, he's over there raising up his own congregation in a tremendous rebellion, and there are people who are following him. And that is how the news came to David unexpectedly this pandemic also came unexpectedly when everything is going well everybody says amen amen glory to god here we are we lift up your hands but the rebellious one the resentful one is going to look for the opportunity to run to run beloved because there's a menace of death nonetheless the faithful will always continue in the work of the lord because the work is not of man. It's not of your pastor. It's not of the leaders. The work is of the Holy Spirit. And we should continue firm, committed, even though the party's over and the problems come and even the danger of death comes. This is the best time for us. Did you know that? That this is the best of time for us? This is the time of the church. This is the time where God wants to use you. You, brother, you, sister. That when everything was good, oh, I'm zealous for the Lord. Well, show that zealousy. Go out to the streets. People are without hope. They need to hear a message of hope. People are crying. day Every day, people are dying. Go and speak to them about the word of the Lord. Sustain your church so that it will be firm in the midst of such darkness and, and keep shining the light and shining the way for others. We should point out to them the times that we are living. What we are living is not something that should prize, surprise us. It is something that the Lord has already spoken. And now it is our time to speak to them and to tell them, not only the one who knows Christ, not only the one who has a congregation, but many who don't know what's happening and why it's happening. The Lord Jesus tells it to us in his word. There will be pestilence. We barely have gone through this one. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be fear because of the waters, because of the floodings. There's going to be signs in the sky, in the heavens, enmity, hatred treason we're seeing it it says the fathers against the children the children against the fathers they're gonna take each other to the courts are we not seeing that because we are all so just because we take justice in our own hands beloved in christ this is the time to arise the pandemic is not the worst time for the church it is the best of times it is the time to shine it is the time now look at these faithful ones. They shined here. They shined greatly. They went out with David. They went out without being afraid that they were going to die. Absalom's going to kill us. He's going against the king. No, they went together with their families to a place that they were not even certain of where that place was. They didn't say, okay, we're going to go from Jerusalem and let's go to a hotel. Let's go to under another roof no they actually went out to the desert to the field yes maybe they had to go upward 
on the Mount of Olives crying without knowing where they were going. But the faithful are there. Here we are. We promise to be here with you. Here we are no matter what happens. Look at how beautiful. Look at what comfort for the servants of the Lord to see that there are people who are willing at all times under whatever circumstance. And it is also the time that the bitter and that the weak ones and that the cowards are going to jump the boat and they're going to leave the pastor alone, the pastor who trusted in them, and this to advance in their own plan. Absalom and Ahitophel walked in their own plan, ignorant to the will of God. Do you think that this pandemic escaped the will of God? Do you think that our life, when the Lord will call us, and that we're going to escape death when the Lord calls us? No. Think about it. Oh, but I cannot expose myself. Well, it's not about exposing yourself. David did not expose his people. David is trusting. And he said it when he went back to Sadak, to Jerusalem. He says, if I would find grace in the eyes of Jehovah God, he will make me return and he will allow me to see her and his tabernacle because Sad Sadok left with the ark and David says no take the ark back I'm not going to use the ark as a good luck charm I'm not going to go hugging my bible and I'm going to die with this no he had the word in his heart and so he went back to Sadok the priest and David is trusting that if he finds grace in the eyes of God, he's going to return alive with all of his people back to Jerusalem. Let's trust. Let's seek God. Let's seek his grace. His grace, his favor is not going to allow for us to die if it is not our time. Amen. So therefore, let's remember this and let's not be like these who, and like many testimonies that we have heard and we have seen the pain of many pastors whose congregation has failed them in this time where they they most need them to preach the gospel the church continues with the expenses with a financial cost and everybody left because they were afraid and the church had to close but the work of the Lord cannot stop Whole families walked with David to an uncertain place. They didn't even know where they were going. They didn't know what was going to happen. But God didn't let them down. They came back triumphant to Jerusalem. And beloved brothers and sisters and friends, trust in God. Let's maintain ourselves firm. Because we have not been overcome with anything that the Lord has not spoken to us. It is all written. Let be, let's be faithful unto death and he will give us the crown of eternal life our king is coming and he is not coming defeated he's coming an overcomer just as david came back an overcomer to jerusalem and all of his faithful men all of his faithful people with him that is how we are going to be next to our overcoming victorious christ our hope is put in him our hope is not in a vaccine our hope is not put in what we can do to escape death. Our hope is not put in the circumstances that surround us. Our hope is put in the one who is coming and is coming soon. How beautiful, beloved in Christ. Let's be faithful. Let's be faithful in all things. Let's be faithful when there's a party. Let's be faithful when there's problems. Let's be faithful when there's threats of death. As this group, these people, these mighty men of David who went out, who went out with him without knowing where they were going and without knowing if they were going to come back alive to Jerusalem. And lastly, a question. Why is it that we get offended so much? Here we see, and we're going to see until the end next week, Absalom and Ahitophel, I 
spoke to you about them, and I wanted to focus very well on the treasons of the Judases uh, and, and how Ahitophel had the same end of Judas, the one who gave Jesus Christ up. And this impacted me very much. Look at how Jesus reacted. He said, friend, with a kiss you betray me. He didn't have bitterness. Now the question is, why do we get so offended? If they see us, if they look at us, we get offended. If they don't look at us, we get offended. If they greet us, look at how they greet us. If they don't greet us, they ignored me. Why are we so easily offended? Why cannot we forgive when there are deep wounds? And, and we all fade in this. Remember, I spoke to you about this a moment ago that we all were let down. We have all been wounded. And we have also wounded. And you might say, no, no. But yes, we have. We all have wounded. All of us have offended. James says that we all offend with words. So this is everybody. There is not one who escapes. But why is it that we cannot forgive the offenses? Do you know why? And this is not the time that you've heard this and you already know this. It is pride. It is pride that does not allow me to forgive. And when I do not forgive, then we get filled with resentment and resentment takes us to bitterness and bitterness takes us to the desires of vengeance that end up in death. Is it the death of the one who offended us? No. The death of the one who is filled with bitterness. It affects us, not the other. What is the solution? Number one, beloved in Christ, forgive. Let's forgive as Christ forgave us. And to know our identity. Do you know who you are in Christ? And... I'm going to read this part. And I've answered like this many times, like the Pharisees. And I hope that you have not done this, but I have done this. Oh, do they not know who I am? I've said this many times. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. And the grace of God is so beautiful. I have said this. Don't they know who I am? Look, I'm going to demonstrate who I am. And right now, I'm going to go and do a lawsuit because they have slandered me. But the Lord has grabbed me by my hair. And I'm glad he has grabbed me. And I'm glad that he hasn't put the rope on my neck. But here I come. Lord, forgive me. That's true. Where am I going? What can I do? I just leave this matter in your hands better. And so I've done this. And I'm not judging you or condemning you or pointing at you. I've said this. Do they not know who I am? But let's see what the Pharisee said. I have also behaved like a Pharisee when they offend me. So John chapter 8, and we're going to see it. The Gospel of John chapter 8, and there is a tremendous debate that the Lord Jesus, and you can read the whole passage later. And it says, and in verse 44, the Lord Jesus tells him, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He, And so they were saying that they were sons of Abraham, but Jesus in this very strong debate says, no, you are sons of the devil. And so the Pharisees answered, and they said, we are not sons of fornication. What are you talking about, Jesus? We have one father who is God. You, you're saying that our father is the devil? Look, let me tell you, Jesus. We are not sons of fornication. And you are a son of fornication because Mary was six months pregnant when she went with Joseph. So you're a son of fornication. Literally, that is what they're telling Jesus. We are sons of God. When we are resentful, when we are in bitterness, when we are filled with pain because they have offended us and in a Christian way we say oh don't they know I'm a son of God but let me tell you something we don't have to say we're the sons of God when we know our identity in Christ but we should live 
like sons and daughters of God? That is the answer. What do I get out of saying, oh, don't they know I'm the son of God? Oh, I'm such and such or so and so. No, I have to show, I have to demonstrate that I'm truly a son of God, a daughter of God. Living as a son or a daughter of God. How do we live as a child of God? As Jesus Christ lived. As simple as that. Loving, forgiving. Look at him. What he said to Judas, friend, with a kiss you turn me in and forgiving on the cross of Calvary. Lord, forgive them for they do not know what they do. May God bless you. The Lord teaches us through his word to be free from resentment, to be free from bitterness, from the desires of vengeance and not end up like Ahitophel, the backstabber, the bitter one, the resentful one who was unable to forgive or end up like Absalom. They ended up the same in death. And so, beloved in Christ, let's know our identity. We are children of God, and as such, we live as true children of God, doing the works of Jesus Christ and living as he lived. May God bless you abundantly is the desire of my heart. Amen. What could you be thinking, Lord, to allow this tragedy? You must have some confidence instilled in me. within this troubled mind an overwhelming pain I look for you to bind because you heal my broken heart calm my spirit stand my God Oh